Yes, please help me say thank you to everybody who makes things happen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, please open your Bibles. You, yes. Now, there again, I want to make sure that every once in a while people might say, what in the world? Uh, that is on purpose. I do encourage people to make some sort of a joyful response to the word Bible because we're trying to communicate that Bible good. Bible good. Uh, so it's going to get in there back of your mind somewhere, down in your heart. As we begin this morning, let me ask you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. And as you do, let me say to you, grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Grace to you. Now, as you're turning there, I do have one more announcement Yeah, for, for us, uh, so lean into this one. This is going to be a little, little this, it's all good, it's just different. Uh, we, how many of you know that we are, we, you, you do know, we are, we are moving forward, taking uh, steps at a time as we're able, we are planning to do some renovation here on this, on this thing. All right, we're going we're gonna to flatten the floor, raise the roof, do all kinds of things, and there's going to be so, all kinds of stuff happening, and some of that... We have, you know, uh, we, we can't control everything as to the timing, but so when things begin to change, the, the, the things would requ- that will require lo- uh, several things to change at once. So what we can do to help relieve some of that change uh, anxiety or change pressure is to implement changes earlier and in stages. We've already done that. We've made some administration changes, some custodial changes. We've just tried to, so that we're adapting to things along the way. So the other thing we're going to do is eventually after we're done with renovation and even during renovation, our service schedules are going to change. And that means we're going to have, that means personnel and staff and kids workers and all of that are going to have to adapt to some new stuff and new plans. So in order to not wait till the last minute to do that, and because... Some of you may not not know this, somewhere around the last 27 months, we've been having a four-service format. Then a couple of years before that, then halfway into that or just into that, we said, I know, let's add, let's add a midweek. Then we added an, a, a Heritage School of Ministry on Sunday nights. So that was a solid five to six or more services regularly happening, not, a, not including all of the fun extra stuff. And, and what that has done is it's been, it's been good and it's been effective for us and even been necessary. It's also been highly taxing on personnel and volunteers. So... Taking all of that together, what, what I have asked us to do is at the end of this month, which is fish fry. How many know fish fry is happening? People have been fishing. Leon's been fishing. Pastor Jay, others have gone and fished. This year, fish fry is there, there will be fish, but it's also a potluck. You're also going to bring food, and we're all going to go to Vancouver Lake, 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon. There's a big gazebo there. There's benches and stuff, and it'll be great. We're all going to have a great time. But that's also our anniversary weekend. So that morning... We will change, that weekend service will change from a three service, from a four service format to a three. So we will go Saturday night and then nine and 11 on June 30th. Someone say nine and 11. So now what that's, now the good news is we have added extra space in the back so we can relieve our parking situation. There's plenty of room, and we're going to ask our, our staff and volunteers, those that are, that, that are going to be here to serve in those services, to park in the back. There's so much good room back there, it'll relieve congestion on the other side that allow people to come and go. And that's going to mean a couple of things for us in here. It's going to mean a little bit less elbow room for some of you. That's I, I like my elbow room. Well, listen. We, it's, we're, you're going to be okay. You, the, other, the good news is you might, you might meet people you didn't know go to church here. Uh, but don't worry, we'll, we will we'll have, uh, there will be services. Now, we are, we are doing this in July and, and maybe into August. We'll see how long it'll be before we put up the tent. Now, the tent's going to have more room than, than we have right now. So they'll, they'll, that'll be better for us. But for a short time, we'll have a little bit more of an opportunity for holy chaos. Okay. And uh, we'll bring in extra chairs, but also I'm kind of figuring summertime there are people coming and going. Now that's I'm not giving you, I'm not asking you to take weeks off of not coming to church. It's going to be fine. We're going to have a great time. There's going to be faith in the room. It's going to be a lot of fun. But new service times, as you'll see on the screen, 
beginning uh, June 30th, still Saturday night at 6, but 9 and 11 with extra parking, and we'll make room for folks as we prepare for the changes to come. We all say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Are you, did you find your Bibles, Philippians chapter 2? Yes. All right. Philippians 2. Let's look at verse 17. Here's, here's Paul. He's writing to his friends in Philippi. He says this. I don't know if that's, I don't think that was me. My wife did jump up and she's rather, you know, sparkly. (laughs) But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Paul here commits his life to pouring joy on the sacrifice of faith. And he invites his readers to do the same. Now, Paul does this in Philippians. In Philippians, there's, it, it's, his, one of, it's the text that where most often Paul expresses his resolve to rejoice. He's already done it in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. He says he's committed to rejoice because no matter what, Christ is being preached. No matter who's doing it, Christ is being preached, and so he rejoices. Secondly, with regard to his own circumstances, he says he's going to rejoice because although he is in prison, he knows that his circumstances are going to end in his deliverance. What he means is, one way or another, I'm either going to be released from prison or I'm going to go and be with the Lord. But either way, I win, so I rejoice. Now here is Paul's Second expression in chapter 2, his resolve to rejoice. But here, Paul says that he is going to rejoice because of or over or literally pour joy on the sacrifice and service of the Philippians' faith. And he describes his life as a drink offering. Now, he uses this metaphor elsewhere as a drink offering when he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. What does that mean when he says a drink offering? Well, a drink offering was a measure of wine that was poured out in celebration with or over or in some way with a sacrificial offering. It's called a libation. It is a joyful expression that accompanies a sacrifice. Try to hear and feel that. The wine is a symbol of joy, so it's a joyful expression that is poured out that accompanies a sacrifice. Now, when we say a measure of wine, that's the cool part because the, how much wine was poured out it was dependent upon the size of the sacrifice. So the more costly the sacrifice, the greater the sacrifice, the more Wine was poured out with it. Wine represented joy, and it was an expression and anticipation of victory and rest. So with this sacrifice that was costly or perhaps even difficult, accompanying it was a libation, a rejoicing. The larger the sacrifice, the greater the expression of joy. So Paul is here confessing that he sees his life, his labor in service, and even his impending death as a drink offering over with accompanying 
the sacrificial obedience of his readers, including the Philippians. His life is a drink offering poured on their faith. Paul is essentially saying, I give my life to rejoice over your faith as an act of worship. And then he says, I urge you to do the same. This is a resolve to rejoice. Joy is an offering poured on the sacrifice of faith. Both Paul and the Philippians were in times of trial, of testing, of challenge, of persecution. Paul's in prison. Philippians are are, are in a, a circumstance of persecution. But Paul resolves to rejoice on top of the trial. And he calls his readers to do the same. Join me, he says, in rejoicing as an offering to God that, to accompany the sacrifice and service of your faith. This is so powerful and necessary for us to share together, for us to resolve together, to rejoice together in the Lord over and with the sacrifice of one another's faith. How can we do that? Why should we do this? How, why does it make any sense? It comes down to our understanding and our appreciation of the joy of the Lord. What is joy? Joy is confidence in the goodness of God. Would you say that with me? Joy is confidence in the goodness of God. To rejoice, then, is to express or to exercise that confidence with thanks, with praise. We rejoice in the grace of God. It's so important for us to appreciate that joy is not calloused, uncaring frivolity. Joy is not denial of pain, nor is it numbness to sorrow. Joy is expressing confidence in the goodness of God, in the midst of it, or on top of it. In this way, joy prevents the hardening of our heart in trouble or challenge or pain. Joy resists the seduction of bitterness and resentment when we feel we are mistreated. The apostles demonstrate this for us. Acts chapter 5 and verse 41 says, So they went on their way from the presence of the council where they had been threatened and beaten. So they went on their way rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer suffer shame for his name. Not that they were glad to have been beaten, but they poured joy on the sacrifice of their faith. Now, in in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, familiar passage to us, to many folks. This is Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail, the very place to where this letter was later written. They're in the Philippian jail. They've been beaten. They've been threatened. They've been put in stocks. They're in physical pain. They're in a dark and damp and dingy dungeon in the middle of it. It's horrible, and it's midnight. Now, we read this, that, that at midnight, they began to pray and sing hymns to God. A lot of times this passage is presented like, hey, if you want to get out of prison, praise your way out. I'm not opposed to that. It's a lot better than anything else you can do. And praise gets stuff done. That is something that we call also true in the text. But the main point is this. They, here they were, sitting in the midst of the sacrifice of their faith. And what did they do? They just poured joy on it. In the midst of their pain and their discomfort, they rejoiced in the goodness of God. And yes, there was an earthquake. And yes, their chains fell off. And yes, the the bars opened. Joy also preserves purpose in the grind. It present, it pre- joy prevents apathy or mission drift. Romans 12, 12 says that we rejoice in hope, we are patient in tribulation, we continue steadfastly in prayer. Oftentimes, this Christian walk is getting up, showing up, doing what's right, and then doing that again. And then doing that again the next week and the next month and the next 
decade and the next decade. And it could have the potential to feel like a grind. Like I'm getting up and I'm showing up and I'm doing this and sometimes I see results and sometimes I don't, but the mail just keeps coming, the dishes just keep piling up, the laundry just keeps happening, I just got to keep getting up and doing what's right and doing it again. But see, when we pour joy on it, it prevents the grind from becoming apathy or mission drift or despair. It infuses the mundane with glory. Joy does not cancel grief. Joy prevents grief from canceling hope. Joy prevents sorrow from becoming despair or cynicism or even hostility. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.10, he says, we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. So joy does not deny sorrow or pain or death. Joy is the is the confidence that our failure is not final. That pain is not permanent and that death is not the end because God is good. I trust the joy of the Lord. I trust it as sacred and real and as a place to process life. I trust it as a place where I can bring with me tears and trial and even the deepest agony. In fact, I dare not go into those places without confidence in the goodness of God. The prophet Habakkuk said in chapter 3, even if the fig tree doesn't blossom and there is no fruit on the vine, If the yield of the olive fails and the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Psalm 71, 14 says, But as for me, I will wait continually and I will praise you yet more and more. Our conclusion is this, we resolve to rejoice, to pour joy on the sacrifice of faith. We resolve to rejoice because we are persuaded that the sacrifice of our faith is worth it. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason, even though I suffer as I do, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. These promises, of course, include the short term in our life. But they also include the whole of our life. They are promises that assure us that God's grace is at work in our whole lives. God will finish what he started. and He'll bring us all the way to the end by His grace. So we pour joy on the sacrifice of faith. You might say, but this is hard or, or this hurts. Sometimes it feels like a grind. That's true. But we do it all unto the Lord and we pour joy on top of it. And as we do, this joy will strengthen us. It will sweeten us. It will sustain us. It will give praise to God who will receive it all as worship. This morning, I want us to close by building an altar. Perhaps right where you are, just building an altar and there offer to the Lord the sacrifice of your faith. 
whether it's a mountaintop or a valley for you or the grind or the glory, then up or an up or a down, here it is, Lord. Here's the sacrifice of my faith. I, I present it before you. And this, and this morning, I just pour out joy on top of it. I rejoice in the grace of God. I give you thanks and praise that God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Would you stand and sing it? And God is so good. God God is so good, he's so good to me, and here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together together worthy, all together wonderful too. So here I am, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say, you're my, you're all together lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to to me. Friends, I'm going to ask anyone that is, that likes, desires to, to remain here where you are or come to the front and find your own altar and just wait upon the Lord. If you need to go or you, it's time for you to go, grace to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. But I'm going to ask Tossie to lead us in this chorus again, and we're just going to create kind of an open place for you to build your own altars before the Lord and just offer to Him your rejoicing, the, the outpouring of your gratitude and praise for His goodness over your life. I bless you in Jesus' name. Let's worship. So here I am to worship. Yeah.